I look fancy today. I have, I'm meeting some really fancy people after this, or else I wouldn't be wearing a tie. I feel very weird in a tie. Although a tie is basically a scarf, which is perfect in like a 35 degree Chicago day. So I, te I teach and talk a lot about uh, SEO and content marketing, content strategy, analytics. <clears throat> and it took me a long time before I got around to focusing on this topic, which is really the main thing that I know about and that we do, because it's about the platform. Today I'm talking about the website itself. And for all the work that we do to bring visitors to our site, and I enjoyed the panel, and the question for the panel was awesome, like, what's your best channel? Uh, this is the other half of the equation, which is about getting people who come to the site to take an action and to convert from a visitor into a lead, or a visitor into a subscriber, or a visitor into an event registrant, or a visitor into a downloader, a visitor into a job candidate, a visitor into a donor, all the different things that changes their status from a visitor or sort of a suspect into a prospect, this is about, this is the topic for the next half hour, which I love, which is super fun. Uh, the changes that we make, and there's the list, the changes that we make to the website actually has a more durable advantage than doing a better job in email or search or social because those are activity based and we have to keep working hard at those. These are things sometimes where you fix it once and you get a much more durable benefit because improvements to the website last a much longer time, right? It's like, you know, you can get more water to point B by either putting more water in your bucket or by fixing the leaks, plugging the holes in the bucket, you're gonna get more water over there. That's kind of how I think about it. I always called him Jacob Nielsen, but he's Danish. I'm pretty sure it's Jakob. Anyone ever heard of the Nielsen Norman Group? Design of Everyday Things, right? His partner, yeah, these, this, these guys are like the usability thought leaders and experts and researchers on the topic that look, you know, Look very far and you'll find tons of their content. So Jakob Nielsen has been doing this for a very long time and he did a study in 2004 to basically just understand how good websites are in general and found the general success rate for websites based on a bunch of tests on a bunch of sites with a bunch of users and a bunch of tasks. And then he redid the research years later to see if the internet has gotten any better. Are websites better than they used to be? Are visitors more successful than they used to be? In other words, are conversion rates better because people are completing their goals and our goals. The answer is yes, websites have improved. The success rate in general was 66% in 2004 and now it's 82%. So he kind of jokingly says, if we assume that improvements on the web will continue at the same rate, the internet will be a good place in the year 2030. Like that's if you extrapolate it up, like we got a long way to go. And what's wrong? That's the question, right? What's wrong? What's the problem? And so this is another part of what he analyzed. If the goal is success where, do I have a, yeah, cat toy. Success where everything is easy, that's what we're trying to have happen. That's what our visitors want and that's what we want. So, or at least success where, where there's only a minimum difficulty. Failure is still pretty high, you know, or partial success is still pretty high. So what's the problem? The answer is findability. People are looking for stuff on our websites and they're not there. They can't find it. It's either hard to find or there's unnecessary friction or the answer is just missing. So that's the topic today. That's the focus of this presentation. It's to address the problems, the conversion issues on our websites, not through design, not through programming, but just through content. Everything I'm discussing today are things that you could do before Monday and probably measure or have a measurable impact on your own conversion rates. Content, it's a content-based approach. And I'm obsessed with this topic, right? Traffic times the conversion rate equals success. That's the math of, of digital marketing. And every action we take as digital marketers should be designed to affect one of those two numbers or why would we do it? To me, it's actually quite just that simple. Email, search, social, right? And then conversion optimization, right? Better landing pages, better messaging, better calls to action, all the little tricks and that's what we're talking about now. I'm, I'm only partly kidding. I have a, an 18 month old baby. I'm a 45 year old guy with like a kid. I, I don't know what, I'm, just, if you have kids, like that makes your back hurt just hearing that. Like that guy's 45 with a year and a half year old. I'm only partly kidding when I say I want two things for this boy. I want him to be really good at SEO and CRO because he is going to be rich if he can just figure those two things out, right? Search optimization, these people are masters of driving traffic and conversion rate optimization, these people are masters of maximizing the percentage of visitors who take action, right? He's actually doing great, He's, so SEO times CRO. They call them dual threat marketers. You know any of these people? They drive insane demand. Like you put one of them on your team and like just amazing things happen. They find all the lowest hanging fruit and fix it right away. So his name is Eli, he's doing great. He's already digging, digging into Google Analytics. It's actually a great book. He tried to eat the book in the next picture. He can't read, he can't even talk. So this was obvious, that's a joke slide. 
So, so the idea is this, right? There are two kinds of visitors to our websites, in search, of course, at least. People who search for a commercial intent key phrase or people who search for an informational key phrase. Go look at your browsing history, and this is how we all use the internet. We either know what we want, we have a presumed solution in mind, or we just want more information about that thing, right? This is, and, there's, and the research shows there are eight times as many searches for informational queries as commercial intent queries, right? I call these phrases question marks, and I call these phrases dollar signs. This is like, why does my sink smell weird? And that's like Chicago plumber. That's what we do online. So my focus here today for you is mostly about the commercial intent key phrases, which means we're mostly talking about the products and service and program pages. Every website basically has two kinds of pages, right? There's the, the sales pages designed to convert visitors into customers or leads. And then there's the mini version of Wikipedia for our industry, where our job is just to give away all the most helpful, useful advice we can to attract the largest audience possible, and maybe, if anything, convert those visitors into subscribers. Some big enterprise companies actually are very good at creating middle of funnel content and middle of funnel conversions because it's a very long sales cycle with multiple decision makers. But for the most part, in my experience, and I have access to like 700 analytics accounts, it's really rare for people who come to the site for why does my sink smell weird to just decide to hire a Chicago plumber, right? It does, there's, there's low conversion rates in general and people don't move that often from a blog post to spending money, it seems to me. On my site, it's like 0.3% or less. It's quite low. These people, though, they have strong intent. And if we can just make it even a small percentage, of, I mean, you can make piles of money by doing a better job of getting those people who came for with buyer intent to take action, right? These people might drive KPIs, email, social, and search, as in subscribe, follow, or link. And, but these are the people that pay the bills, right? So anyway, so we're talking a little bit about both, but I'm mostly focused on the products and service pages. And here's my little framework. Steal it, use it, it's, this is just uh, my best, my latest thinking on this in general, is that we want to make this, this arrow on the left bigger and stronger, this is like vector geometry, we're in high school, and that arrow on the right, smaller and weaker, we want to improve motivation and reduce friction because that's when this little dude moves over there to the right and you make, you create a demand. So how can we make this arrow bigger and stronger, increase motivation and reduce friction? And the data shows, it's very easy, and a lot of marketers have learned this already, even a small amount of friction or uncertainty will kill conversion rates. Even one or two unanswered questions on your website will kill conversion rates. So, is the laptop behind me? There it is. So here's the framework. Our audience has questions, we must understand those. Digital marketing is a test of empathy. We must understand those questions. We answer those questions, we provide evidence to support our answers, and we give them clear, specific calls to action using urgency whenever possible. So our, the presentation's basically just these four steps. We're just gonna go through them one at a time. Sound good? Here's an example, the plumber again, B2C. My faucet is leaking, it's an urgency-based visit. This person came to your website with a, with a strong intent, right, they have, they have a lead, they, they have a, a need to solve right now. How soon can you come and fix it might be the question of this visitor. You have to answer that question through some messaging, same day on time service for 20 years or else they're very unlikely to convert. And then supply evidence to support that answer. I'm so glad they came right away. That's a testimonial. That's a third party endorsement supporting the claim you just made. Without that evidence, you, that is called an unsupported marketing claim. Go look at your website and count the number of unsupported marketing claims. There might be hundreds. <laughs> a lot of people have websites that are just filled with general stuff that doesn't really have any evidence backing it up. And then the action, the clear, the clear specific call to action. This is even contextual. Schedule a visit, time frame. You get the idea. Opposite, this is B2B bazillion dollar marketing decision, marketing technology decision. Does this connect with my database? Answer, it integrates with the top 50 platforms. Evidence, thanks for all the help connecting to my system. Logos of tools, reasons to believe. And then the action, look, I've reduced the psychological threshold of this action. Just chat, we're not spending money, just chat with an expert. Just start a conversation. Chat with an expert about integration, right? I did this with, I did a senior housing summit uh, event a few months ago. And they were telling me all the questions, right? It was super fun. What do people have to know before they move in? I mean, this is a life decision, right? Can I bring my dog? Yes, we are pet friendly. My, Buster, my puppy Buster just loves his new friends. You can already feel it, right? It sounds credible, right? I, I, look how weak it would be without that. Discuss pet relocation with an associate. You can almost, you're ready to become a lead. You're not even a senior move with a dog, right? But you can feel how that would be more compelling than you know, we are number one, you know, best in class. This is not generic, this is contextual, it's about the audience. 
Empathy. Empathy. It's a test of empathy. So there's all kinds of answers. My friend Justin Rondeau is a total expert. He's done 3,000 A-B tests. I saw him last week. He's a genius. He works at digitalmarketer.com, and he, and he summed it up. Optimization is about meeting user expectations, and page elements anticipate their questions or objections, basically the same thing, and the page design prioritizes those, right? The page ends up emulating a conversation with a salesperson. It's like mind control, right? You're answering the next question as the question pops into their mind because you know the general order in which people need to have their questions answered. And he's right, and he gave a lovely presentation in Boston at the Marketing Props B2B forum where he said, every page must answer these questions. Who's the company? What do I get? Is it valuable? Is my information safe? And so on. I get it, and Justin's right. We have to generically answer these general questions. But every company is different, or else we could all have the same website. The problem with Justin's advice here is that it's too generic. Ask this of your own audience, right? And you'll find, I did this at a, it's a graduate school not far from here, and I asked them this question. It was uh, all the admissions advisors and everyone in the same room. What questions do people ask before filling out an application to go to this school? I could not write down the answers fast enough. They gave me 60 different questions that people have. Now I know what this website needs to do. They gave me the roadmap. I know exactly how to build this website now, right? This is it. This is the job. Our job is to answer questions. I had a client ask me once, why, in one word, Andy, in one word, tell me what, our, what, what, uh, what the website has to do. That was it. Answer. That's why they came. That's why you all go to websites, right? It's not them. I keep saying them, but it's us. Why do we go to websites? It's to get our questions answered. So yeah, I knew exactly right how to build these pages. All I had to do was prioritize this, and I construct these you know, super high converting pages by just using the data that they gave me about what the audience cares about. There's tons of tools. I mean, this is more like data-driven empathy, but there's tons of tools that will scrape the internet for questions. Answerthepublic.com is one of them. Go to answerthepublic.com and type in any topic, and it will give you a pile of questions people ask related to that topic. Some of those might be sales-related, conversion-related questions that you can use to build higher converting landing pages. It's a fun tool. This view is actually annoying because it's circular. I mean, it's fun. It looks cool at first, right? Yeah. You'll be annoyed with it in three minutes if you try to use it. You click on a tab at the top, and it puts them in lists, which is helpful. So I ask my clients this question. You should all ask yourselves this question. You should go ask the sales team or the customer service team these questions, right? What do people need to know before they will before they buy from us, right? So we can front load their experience before they're even a lead with the answers to their questions so by the time they contact you, right, they're ready to go, they're a warmer lead. Answer the questions or else, so they don't leave and go to some other website to find those answers. The one feature that all of our sites have in common is the back button and someone else is answering that question if you're not. Uh, this is a crappy slide, I didn't redesign this. But these are notes I took at a conference in Vancouver where Joel Kletke, I should just, if he should be here. He's amazing. Joel Kletke explained his process for interviewing a company's clients. And he, the data he gets, he uses the, the actual answers from those interviews as the copy on the pages. Remind me, I'm sorry, I should share a link. There's a link to this video where he gives this presentation. He shows how he did this for HubSpot. HubSpot was mentioned earlier. And doubled the conversion rate of HubSpot landing pages. Joel Kletke doubled the conversion rate of HubSpot landing pages by interviewing HubSpot customers, asking these questions, taking their actual answers, and building the pages with their copy. You can't write copy as good as the audience can. It's impossible. The, copy, the words they give you will be far more valuable than anything that you could write yourself. Everything you write is automatically marketing, but when they write it, it's more like evidence or proof. So anyway, yeah, we'll share the slides, or the, there's a video, and, or uh, ask me later, and I'll just give you a link to Joel's it's called the Action Conference in Vancouver, the Unbounce CTA Conference in Vancouver um, from last year. He's got the, the videos online. Uh, Marcus Sheridan built a career on this tip. <laughs> it's actually just called FAQ Content. There's really nothing magical about it. Marcus finally just wrote a book about it called They Ask You Answer. Right? If you ever see Mark, Marcus give a presentation, he's like super high energy, kind of intimidating. He runs around the audience, asking people questions. But that's the point, right? Someone, that, that's why they come. Okay. Now that we know the message, there's two ways that we can upgrade that in terms of the format and, and, the, and the answer. Text and w everything you say in text is actually pretty weak, right? We are the best number one on time. That's the brand itself saying it, and that's saying it as text. That's just basically an unsupported marketing claim. As we said, that's not super strong. 
But you have two opportunities, opportunities to upgrade that. One is to give it a different messenger. The other is to use a better format. So here's some examples. Thanks for being so quick. John Q customer, it's a written testimonial. At least it's in a different, it's a better messenger, right? Buster loves his new friends. The third party endorsement as a trust seal or award or association membership or security certificate even, right? Anything that comes from someone else and it's a, it's a visual. These are often used at the bottom of websites and called like a trust box and it's better than nothing. Logos of clients is an even better example. But the most powerful, most upgraded format in the atomic bomb of marketing content is the video testimonial because it's the audience's voice themselves. I can imagine being that person. That's who I'm considering being is that person, a member of that audience, the customer themselves. And it's in a video format, which has trust, it has tone of voice, it has body language. You just feel it's far more compelling. If there's a hierarchy, I don't have a slide for this, but this is exactly the hierarchy for web content. Motion is more powerful than images. Images are more powerful than text. I guess that's what this says, right? Motion is more powerful than images. Images are more powerful than text. That's going to be, if you did an eye tracking test on any page, you're going to find that that's the visual hierarchy. We just heard a second ago, right? Use GIFs as eye stop, you know, as um, uh, attention grabbing images and uh, turn videos into GIFs to make, to improve uh, click through rates and emails. So the next step is to increase is, is evidence. We want to make this arrow stronger by adding more support and make that arrow weaker by, by, uh, by building certainty to get that person to move over. And there's really two kinds of evidence that we can add to websites. This is the, in college now, Aristotle's three modes of persuasion. Pathos, logos, and ethos. Now, I'm not talking about design and programming, so I'm going to set ethos aside. That's basically the curb appeal and the credibility of the website looks professional. But we can add evidence that is either pathos or logos as in emotion or reason. And there's different personality, web, uh, different personality types of all of our visitors, and there's some people who like one and some that like the other. But generally speaking, yeah, we're going to add uh, reason and logic and evidence and w would be something like this. This is quantitative, 41%. That's the average increase in conversion rates from the last 20 websites we launched. I've got a number there. And if you're interested in data, I've got something for you that's, that's uh, uh, reason. But what's more powerful than that, and there's lots of data to support this, and Justin makes the point himself, the, the testimonial, that's quantitative, it's a story, and it's either easier to feel emotion in connection to that. So on the same exact page, we have the second type of evidence, which is a testimonial, which is this, without question, choosing Orbit to design and build our website was blah, 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 blah. It sounds like a, like a witness, right? It's like if we were in court, you'd put that person in the witness box. Don't go to court without evidence or witnesses. This is, what, this is how we're building our case. Don't make marketing claims without supporting them with evidence. Some of this is relevant mostly to B2B, but here's the seven things that I, I recommend you consider adding to your testimonials. If the logo is recognizable, and that's kind of a famous hometown hero, Chicago company, the logo is helpful, increases visual prominence of the testimonial, slowing down the scanner. And then, I love this tip, don't take the juiciest eight words or five words out of the testimonial and make it a subhead. A lot of testimonials are pretty weak because they're just all text and there's nothing, no stopping power. So that's going to increase the percentage of people who read the testimonial or get the message. There's a good reason why Amazon makes you write a headline for every review, right? Why do they do that? <laughs> They've been millions of dollars of usability testing and they know that from eye tracking studies that's going to increase the percentage of people who see that powerful marketing copy. Now make the person real. The picture, the name, the company, the title, right? That's going to make the person more real. Faces are, of course, totally unique in all of images and super powerful in marketing. Nothing compares. Babies stare at faces more than other images from the time they're born. And now this is me being sneaky. Uh, this is the one advantage that you get using text-based testimonials. If this page is optimized for the, for the phrase website conversions, the text-based testimonial is actually an opportunity to indicate relevance. That's what SEO is all about, indicate relevance for the topic. So this is basically a combination of cheese and mousetrap. I can increase text-based testimonials, keyword-focused testimonials, can increase the total number of visitors and the percentage who take action. It's, uh, this, one of, this is one of only four tactics I know of in all of digital that increase traffic and conversion rates at the same time. Now, this is a theory, I don't have data for this, but this is a theory that I've been working on I'm gonna share with you, which is, uh, for years I said, hey, make sure you put a testimonial on every page. Uh, I also recommend, I don't know if I have a slide for that, but I also recommend, um, here's another question. Where's the best place to put a testimonial? Right next to the marketing claim it supports, right? 
Don't make them hunt. Where's the worst place to put a testimonial? On the testimonials page. Why? Nobody goes there. Yeah, nobody even, nobody, if they wouldn't read it, it's, it's never a popular page. If you have a testimonials page, go look at the analytics and ask yourself if that's the, the a highly visited page. You've got your best stuff on that page that no one sees, right? Does anyone put billboards on little streets in Ravenswood? No. <laughs> you put billboards on highways. Put your best foot forward. Put your most compelling content on the places where people will see it. The best place for testimonials are right next to the marketing claim they support, or else they are on just on the highest traffic pages. It's uh, behavior, site content, all pages. The all pages report in your analytics is sorted by the popularity of the page, right? Best foot forward. So here's my theory, that's the book I wrote. Here's my theory about the, the right amount of testimonials. I'm a huge nerd. I actually put this into Photoshop and with a pixel ruler measured the height of an Amazon page. 7,200 pixels. That's another point, right? Short pages, whoever said short pages were good? Never seen a study that supported that. You've got, digital's great. You've got all the room and time in the world to just make the case completely with everything you need to say. It's not like TV or radio or print where, you're, where it's finite, right? Take, d put it all there. Okay, 7,200 pixels. 3,100 of these pixel, pixel, vertical pixel height is evidence. That's 43% of the page. I'm not sure there is like a too much evidence. Do lawyers just stop like, no, nah, uh, we, we, we already did a witness, we're good. No, you would never do that. You're still, you're still persuading. It's not done until they click the call to action. It's not done until they click the call to action. Okay, this is Ali Gardner. I mentioned Unbounce. They do the, the call to action conference. Ali's one of the co-founders, and, and his speaker's promotion page is like an amazing case study that I steal from. Uh, he's using every trick in the book, starting with visual hierarchy. Every page is a visual hierarchy. What's the most visually prominent thing on this page? Ali, we talked about faces as being super prominent. What is Ali doing? Looking at the headline, you've heard this trick, and Ali hates the baby example, but it's the easiest to use. Baby looks at the camera, you look at the baby. Baby looks at the headline, you look at the headline. You look where they look. Eye tracking and heat tracking studies have shown this forever. Every magazine and newspaper photo editor has known this forever, right? You're drawing an invisible line. It's literally an arrow, it's line of sight, right? So that's exactly what Ali's doing in this picture. He's getting you to look at the action-oriented headline. It starts with a verb, I love this page. So then the next thing, on, and oh, here's an example. Conversion XL is a lab and they do studies like this. I just told you, so it's maybe obvious. Which of these things gets visitors to look at the form the most? First one, obviously not, right? Who thinks the second one? About a third of people. Who thinks the third one? Good job. You got a pro group you pulled together here. Actually, the arrows, the, these little arrows are just killing it. It's amazing. Look, you want, you want someone to look at something? Just draw an arrow. <laughs> it's super weird. Like, what? That makes perfect sense. Yeah, the arrow is even more compelling and driving more attention than the person looking at the form. Not weird, I guess. Just like, hey, look at that. You just pointed something. Okay, what the next? And then he adds evidence, right? This is this is um, uh, reason. Ali was rated the number one speaker at 75% of his speaking engagements. He is an amazing presenter. And then look at the look at the button. Look at the color. Look at how prominent it is. Why? It's a cool page, and that's the only warm color, except flesh tones, that's the only warm color. He's got orange literally on blue. Those are complementary colors. Remember art class from like high school, right? If they're on the opposite sides of the color wheel, they're literally complementary, and they are, that's the most visual, that's the strongest contrast you can create. And on a page of all cool colors, right? Green, blue, and purple are cool. Red, orange, and, and yellow are warm. Any, and in, in the context of cool, warm will pop. So that's exactly what Ali's doing here. That's the, that's the prominence of the button. This is, you, you, be careful because I made this mock-up page, but you get the idea. What's the most visually prominent thing on this page? The Pinterest button. Yeah, it's a cool, minimal, light-colored page, right? Then you put those super prominent buttons. What does that button do? They leave, right, yeah. If I designed a store for you, because you're a retailer, and I'm like, yeah, check out, the, I'm an architect, and I'm brilliant, and look at this store I designed, and you walk in the front door, and there's like a giant exit sign right there, you'd fire me. That'd be, that'd be like a bad job, right? Because I'm literally telling your visitors to leave, right? And if they go, they, these people are just, they're not gonna come back. <laughs> these are not, uh, yeah. Be very cautious using color contrast 
because that's going to create a lot of visual prominence, putting that thing at the top of the visual hierarchy. And if you have giant exit signs as the most prominent thing on your page, ask yourself, would you really want your visitors to click on that thing? Does that help your conversion? Or is that them going backwards, upwards through the funnel? You just gave your visitor to a company worth $200 billion. They don't need the visitors. Oh, and this is my uh, another joke slide. If they click on the YouTube link, they're going to end up on this page. It's supposed to animate. Don't, send your, don't ever send your visitors to a, a, a website that has this video because they're going to forget why they came. Yeah, that timing was horrible. Joke did not work at all. Use the, um, uh, this is a violation of their brand guidelines because they don't want you to do it, but put the, put the logos in the footer. People can find them if they want them. I'm, I'm in favor. I love social media. And you can have the color happen when they're on the rollover, for example. I've reduced them to the very bottom of the visual prominence. If you're highly motivated to find them, they're right there. The other thing that Ali's got here, read this text. Book Ali for your marketing event. Down here, I want Ali to speak at my conference. Have you heard this before? Point of view can affect conversion rates. Because the button is, a, is, is when you're participating in that person's internal dialogue. All content on all websites should be second person language except the calls to action. Make them first person because now you're in the person's head, right? Every click on every website is a metaphor for a certain action. So it's that person taking the action. So yeah, when you scroll down the page, he's got a video testimonial from a famous influencer. He's got tons of social media evidence. He got answers your top questions. And then he's got all of this. I think it would, he'd have an even higher conversion rate if he made this the first one. I think he should move that guy over. <laughs> this is me trying to, you know, I, I made mine very concise. I was trying to get him to, uh, uh, to use it. And then, and then the call to action at the bottom. The unbounced thesis is that your call to action box should be like a mini web page with a headline and the, call to, and the button and an answering another question there at the bottom. Ali will respond personally. So this is a 6,800 pixel tall page. 3,400 pixels of that are proof. 51% of the page. Maybe that's one of the most, maybe that's really what our websites are about. Answer their questions and then give them specific uh, uh, evidence to support those answers, followed by a clear specific call to action. And again, there is no research. I've never seen any research that said that shorties were perform any better. Take all the time you need to put it all into one page. This is my tip for growing your email list. That was my old subscribe box. This is my new subscribe box. The new one got, that number's wrong, a 4,800% increase in conversion rates. Why? It went from this, we like to share our thoughts about blah, 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 I'm bored, no one's gonna read that, the subscribe takes you to another page, to this. Join the X number of people who receive what, sign up, subscribe, right on the same page. The difference, prominence, promise, and proof. It's prominent, big red box. Color, you know, pattern interrupter, it's, a, it's the color contrast. Promise, what do you get? Web marketing tips, how often do you get them? Bi-weekly. And proof, social proof, evidence, supporting with evidence, join the X number of people. This will do wonders for the size of your list the, the, the day you make the change. It's the three Ps of, dig, of, of email sign-up forms. It appeared on the side, it was a sticky form. In other words, no matter how far you scrolled, it stayed there. Now we have a sticky footer. No matter how far you scroll, it stays there. This is uh, how, um, and if you look at your own sign-up form and it just says email sign-up submit, ask yourself why anybody would do that. It'd be weird if someone signed up for that. <laughs> that would just, why would they, it's, it would be crazy. Why would people do that? So yeah, the three Ps, prominence, promise, and proof. You'll see good examples of these all over the place, including, Testimonials, if you don't have a large list, you can just use a testimonial or an endorsement or an influencer or whoever your subscribers are. That's the worst email sign-up form in the world. <laughs> 22 fields, 20 are required. It asks you how much money you make. That is a disaster, no one ever subscribed. Finally, we're at the bottom in, a call, in calls to action. Very briefly, specificity correlates with conversion. Giving them a little bit more information about what they're gonna get correlates with conversion. A few extra words, 31% increase. A few extra words, find your gym and get membership, 213% increase. This is all Michael Agard's research. Uh, he's also at Unbounce right now. So that's the example there. Increase my conversion rate, right? We're telling you what you're going to get. Contact us is not a call to action. Pay close attention to the verbs. So we wanna increase the benefit, the perceived benefit, and reduce, reduce the cost. It's an ROI calculation. Every visitor to every website, everyone, all of us, all day long, we are doing super fast cost-benefit calculations in our mind before we click anything. In every search results page, in every email inbox, in every social stream, you are doing a super fast cost-benefit calculation. 
So to increase that likelihood of them clicking, we want to make that thing either higher R or lower I. Right? Greater benefits or lower costs. Give more information about why they would do that, about the impact on their life. They're going to solve all their problems today. <laughs> I've overpromised on that button. Maybe, that, maybe not that button. But look, you get that when, now, start reading now. I love how Emma just closed her, her, her session, right? She's like, oh, if you want these slides, go to that address and get them right now. Did you feel that? I felt that when she said that. I'm like, yeah, that sounds immediate. That's a lower investment. I don't have to worry, the, you know, less risk. So yeah, what, why would they care? What's in it for me? My designers don't love this tactic because on mobile, the, button tech, the buttons get really tall because the words wrap. I don't care how pretty it looks. I, I care about conversion rates. But, and this is how we do it, right? This is, a, this is a box. It's a page block at the bottom of our service pages. What's your strategy? There's Sarah. Sarah, seeing her face reduces the uh, apprehension or psychological threshold, right? Discuss your website with Sarah. We get leads like this. Hi, Sarah. It works. That really works. So, and, so bottom line, find and fill the gaps. If your website has unanswered questions, it's unsatisfying for your visitors. They're less likely to convert because there's information they needed important information from sales conversations that they're not finding. And if it doesn't have evidence, it's weak. If there's no actions, it's just not compelling. What is an FAQ page except important information out of context? Don't expect your visitors to click around and make the case for themselves. If the question is really frequently asked, it should be in the place where the question pops into their mind. FAQ means important but badly filed. It means like no label. Like FAQ as a label is totally vague. And what's a testimonials page except important evidence out of context? Build these pages so they emulate a sales conversation. Flowing down the page, flowing through their mind, right? Top questions answered, evidence to support those, act those answers. Answer, evidence, call to action, answer, evidence, call to action with as many pixels as you need. Oh, there's the slide. And this site, testimonials, is the 31st most popular page. <laughs> there it is, go look at your all pages report. Trust me, it's not in the top 10. That would be weird. So the ROI of, of CRO is huge, right? Through no other changes except content, you can generate, look at that, that's 26% more demand generated. That's, that makes you busy, that makes the phone ring, that means your team, that means you're hiring, that means you're buying software to manage demand. It makes a big, big difference. And, you, and that's a one-time and permanent improvement compared to you know, getting 10% better results from search or working your butt off to drive a little bit more traffic every month from Facebook. Fix this first and then get better at driving traffic, right? It makes the, every visitor to the website more likely to take action, a profitable action that pays the bills. I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. I think we have time for just a few questions. Okay, well, I have a question. Um, when you're talking about the contrasting colors of the wheel for call to action, how do you balance that contrast and that visual appeal with, say, your branding guidelines that the rest of your team really wants to adhere to? Well, my design team doesn't always do this, but uh, a classic and prescriptive piece of advice would be to, as you create the brand style guide for digital, you might have one offline, right, your brand, your brand book, whatever, the one for digital, you might want to think carefully about it and choose one color to be the pop or accent color that becomes the action. It's, it's, uh, studies show that this often works. Choose one color to be the action color and use that color throughout anywhere you, where you want people to take action. It's the rollover on the navigation or it's the, I mean, it, it's, it's uh, higher on the visual hierarchy because it contrasts with the other colors. So uh, when you want to answer the question like what color do people click on the most on the internet, the answer is whatever color contrasts most with the context around it it's called the, the von Restorff effect. Hedwig von Restorff, psychology researcher from I think the 60s, like discovered that the human eye gets too much information, therefore we scan for pattern interrupters, right? You guys are wearing a lot of like cool and, and, and muted colors. She's got a red sweater, she stands out among all of you. Pattern interrupters, that's why things uh, pop. So declare the action color based on your brand and use it consistently. So, um, that form, the 22, pay, uh, 22 question form, hilarious, very good. Okay, so can we figure out 
where is not a happy medium because it's not in medium. It's got to be much shorter. But tell me a little bit about when we are doing lead gen and uh, those we're looking very much at the numbers and the and the conversion rates, but we're also um, seeing repeat visitors. A lot of us here have people who have very. We, we don't need a lot of clients because we have larger average tickets for clients, but we do need to know more about them. And so, in landing pages, we are using things like the first time they come through, I'll ask them one particular question. Mm -hmm. If my system already knows that, it'll ask the secondary question, etc. Can you talk a little bit about that and how to strike? the right, um, I wouldn't say balance or medium, but how do you do that correctly so that you are actually getting better intelligence on your, um, on your, on your lead, but not killing right. the conversion rate? Right, so there's the, the research always shows that there's an inverse correlation between number of form fields and conversion rates. The more you ask, it gets, that's called a greedy form. The more you ask, the, the lower the conversion rate would be. And so my advice for most people that I meet is just like, are you asking for more than you need on your, on your contact page or on your, on your landing pages? And would it be, and is it, are any of the things that you ask, there are things that you could ask offline after you've already started talking to the person in a sales conversation? Do you treat that lead differently depending on those answers? Or are you about to ask them that on the phone anyway, like as soon as you respond to the lead? So that's my classic advice for lead gen. But in your example, right, progressive profiling, it's called where you know that the person has been before and the token shows that they've been there before and the data and the, and the uh, marketing automation platform has now the opportunity to ask them a different question so you can build out your database and target them differently. Yeah, if you're that sophisticated in your marketing and that person is already in your sales funnel or already been to the site or it's their fourth webinar, mm -hmm. yeah, then uh, I, would ask, I would ask questions but in a strategic way. So how would I treat them? I'm asking myself this. If, I'm adding friction, so the benefit of adding that friction should be greater than the cost of the friction to the conversion rate. Okay. So with the, the benefit should be something where, yeah, I can definitely talk to them differently because now I know their job title or their geography. I don't collect data I don't need or I would, because I know that the, just asking for the data will cost me something. Also, there's a trick in analytics where you can track form abandons. Google Tag Manager combined with Google Analytics will give you a report that shows what percentage of people quit filling out your form after the third field. And then you'll know, wow, that's where, I'm, that's where it's hurting me. As soon as I ask about birthday, everybody leaves. Or we had a site that, uh, we did the site for the Greater Chicago Food Depository. And it's an e-commerce transaction looking page for the donation. But there's a page, there's, a, there's a, a, a question that's like, do you want to give this anonymously or in someone else's name? We put hot jar on the website and we recorded screen sessions and we watched people just cruising through, right? Oh yeah, I know how to fill out an e-commerce form. And then when they got to that, do you want to donate anonymously? Huh, I don't know. You just saw them stop. Freaked me out. It sent chills. <laughs> Ever have an analytics moment where you're like, ooh. <laughs> that probably could have been asked on the next page. Get their money, then ask what you need to ask next, right? So I could have, um, that was a stopper, a psychological hurdle for them. So I could have reduced a lot of friction by asking that on the subsequent page. Thank you. Any more questions? All right. Thank you so much, Andy. Thanks, guys. Sure.